wondering about the 1920s and 1930s. Um, I've heard really good things about Calvin Coolidge, and he was very pro-capitalism. And, um, and then also I'm wondering about FDR, and I've heard that he was largely responsible for the Great Depression. And then I'm wondering how Herbert Hoover kind of fits into that. So you want a quick his uh, uh, economic history right. of uh, the United States in the 20s to 30s? <laughs> Calvin Coolidge was, was pretty good. Uh, so in the, in the, in the, uh, other, in the um, recession, I think it was 1920, uh, his response was nothing, no stimulus, no government intervention, nothing. It was a deep recession, and we got out of it almost immediately. Bam, the economy grew right out of it and continued growing into the 20s. Uh, it's, you could argue that Fed policy under Coolidge was off, particularly towards the end of his administration. Uh, they probably printed too much money, even though they were in a gold reserve, they cheated, and there was too much money being printed, which ultimately helped lead to misallocation of resources throughout the economy, ultimately leading to the uh, kind of the stock market bubble and, and its collapse. So Federal Reserve policy under Coolidge was probably as bad as it's been since. It, it probably wasn't very good. Um, so Coolidge, then you get Hoover. Hoover is probably you know, one, of, one of the worst presidents in American history. And certainly the person responsible for the Great Depression. The myth about Hoover is that he was a laissez-faire president. That he just let the 1929 crash, stock market crash happen, and then he did nothing. And then FDR came and saved the day by being activist. Nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, Hoover was an activist president from day one. So Smoot-Hawley was passed and signed by Hoover. Smoot-Hawley restricted trade, uh, raised uh, uh, tariffs in the United States, which created a trade war throughout the, the world and basically destroyed half the world's economies. Uh, as a response to the recession, which the 1929 crash um, started, uh, Hoover doubled the income tax rate, uh, which was horrific for an economy in a recession. Uh, most of the regulations that later FDR kind of expanded and built upon were started under Hoover. Uh, Hoover was, a, indeed, uh, FDR's administration viewed itself as just continuing the policies of Hoover. So Hoover was a very, very interventionist president. So Now, what happened was that later in life, he became a pro-capitalist. So later in life, he identified that as a mistake and converted to kind of being a free marketer. And that's why the Hoover Institute at Stanford University, uh, which had Milton Friedman as, as its head for a long time, is, is relatively free market. And that comes from the kind of the later day conversion of Hoover into a free market guy. But he was a progressive Republican. He was very progressive. He was very interventionist, very much a statist as president. Uh, so Coolidge was, was good for the most part. Uh, the government didn't grow that much, but there was massive still misallocation in the economy because of the Federal Reserve, uh, which caused the collapse in 29, which would have just been a recession if the government had stayed out of it, but the government didn't stay out of it under Hoover. It intervened dramatically and therefore caused a you know, real banking crisis in 31 and 32. And by the time uh, FDR was elected, we were in a depression. So you can't blame FDR for the depression. We were in a depression by 30. He was elected in 32. He took office, I think, in March of 33. Now, it, it gets complicated because even during the, the, the election, uh, FDR indicated that he would probably take the U.S. off the gold standard. So people were worried about him taking that skill off the gold standard. So what do you do if you worry that he's going to take you off the gold standard? You go to the bank and you withdraw your gold because in those days the banks held gold versus your, your money. So everybody went to the bank and withdrew their gold, which caused the banks to collapse. So the banking crisis of 32, to a large extent, is probably the result of the expectation that FDR would take us off the gold standard, which he did in 1933 when he became president, so the expectation was actually true. Uh, once he got into office, I think everything he did basically was wrong, or almost everything he did was wrong. Uh, he raised taxes, he increased government spending, he created laws that gave huge amount of power to unions 
But, but the original law, for example, around unions, around giving legal protection to unions, was passed under Hoover. Uh, what FDR did was expand it. Right? Um, so basically what you got from 33 to 36, the economy got a little bit better, but not dramatically so, and they were pouring money into these stimuluses, and he was packing the Supreme Court, and he was doing all kinds of, all kinds of bad stuff. Right? And uh, in 33, it got better, and then in 33, 37, it collapsed again. And uh, by the beginning of World War II in 39, basically the economy had been flat for 10 years. Nothing had happened. And so you certainly can't say the FDR did anything good you know, in, in terms of the U.S. economy. And then people say, well, then it ended because you know, the war started. And um, so if we're talking about economic mythology, then this is the biggest myth of all. The Great Depression, the idea is the Great Depression ended because of World War II, right? Because unemployment went down. During World War II, unemployment was very low. Uh, people were working. And uh, GDP, gross national product, went up quite a bit. So is this a good thing? So this is basically the most prevalent myth in economics. It's called the, and, and you can see it everywhere. The stimulus package is just a, stimulus packages are just a form of this myth. This is the myth of the broken window, the fallacy of the broken window. The idea is this, and this is, goes back to Bastiat, and there's a wonderful chapter in, the, if you want, after read one, you should read one book in economics, right? And if you have to, if you're going to read one book in economics, the book you should read is Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt and his first chapters on the broken window fallacy. And then he shows how everything in economics is really, the bro all the fallacies are broken window fallacies, really. They all are. So the broken window fallacy is this. You give a kid a rock, and you tell him to throw the rock through the baker's window. So he throws the rock through the baker's window, and the window shatters. Now what happens? Economic activity. This is cool, right? The baker takes out his money, and he goes, and he buys a window. The window maker goes out and hires a workman. To, to, to make a window, he then has to hire another workman to actually put the window into the baker's win into, you know, the glass into the baker's window. Wow, GDP would just went up. Because we met GDP is measured by this activity. What's the fallacy there? That at the end of the day, all we have is a window, which we had before. So how could there be economic activity? There's nothing new here. Indeed, there's less. What has gone away? The baker's money. The baker's money that would have gone to do what? Build another furnace, maybe invest in the bank, which would have, lent, would have lent the money to some entrepreneur, would have invented some new thing. So war is the same thing. This notion that we create economic activity by building tanks and then blowing up buildings has got to be the most bizarre notion in human history. Yet Krugman holds this consistently. So when, when this big hurricane swept through the East Coast a few months ago, Krogman was cheering because it was going to destroy stuff. And when stuff gets destroyed, you have to rebuild it. And that creates economic activity. And isn't that cool? And, and he's right in this sense. The GDP goes up. Because the, when the window's there and the money's in the bank being invested, GDP is somewhat... GDP measures... Consumption. But the baker is not taking his money out of investment and he's consuming it by buying a window. So nominally, in the numbers, it goes up, but that's why GDP is a lousy measure of economic activity. It's not a good measure. So yes, during World War II, GDP went up, but did standard of living go up? Did quality of life go up? No, it went down. People died. And unemployment went down. Well, that's easy. You send half the male population overseas to fight a war, unemployment's going to go down. But the standard should be standard of living, quality of life. And that clearly went down in World War II, partially because your husbands and your kids were dying, and partially because you, know, you were working to build tanks instead of building, you know, making bread and making technology and building stuff that we actually benefit our lives. You're building stuff that blows stuff up. It doesn't create anything. So no, World War II was a disaster. What saved the US economy is that after World War II, uh, they had realized that the disaster that the last 20 years had been, and they unwound a lot of the regulations. 
they freed up the economy. And, uh, and, and, they, and we went back on a pseudo gold standard. So Bretton Woods, plus the fact that they deregulated a lot, they loosened up a lot of the controls that were imposed under FDR, made it possible for the economy to grow uh, starting in 1945-46, real growth. Yeah, it's, it started under Truman and then Eisenhower. I mean, they didn't do a great job of liberalizing the economy, but relative to where we were before, they liberalized it. So they didn't go all the way as they should have, but they liberalized it a little bit, enough to get the, the entrepreneurial juices of Americans going. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you all.